students, I hope you're all having a great day today. My name is Torres and I want to take a moment to thank you for joining me for a little Psych 101. In this video, we will learn about biology and behavior and continue our conversation about the nervous system. Specifically, we'll be looking at the brain. This video has four overarching ideas. The body communicates using two systems, the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system is divided into two major parts. The central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord, is the command center of the entire body, and the peripheral nervous system, which consists of all other nerves. The brain is divided into four different lobes, each responsible for different body functions. Finally, Brain imaging technology can represent and measure brain activity. The topic of this video will focus on the vocabulary on these two slides. You can find this information in the Google slide presentation and in the Psych 101 Key Vocab Google Doc. Both of these files are linked in the description box below. The past few videos has focused on the idea that everything psychological is simultaneously biological humans are biological creatures living in social spaces. To understand human psychology, it's important to study how biological, psychological, and social systems interact. The branch of psychology that researches the interactions of biology, behavior, and mental processes is biopsychology. The anatomy and physiology of the nervous system explains the organizational role of the brain in psychology. When studying the anatomy of the nervous system, we need to think of the nervous system being divided into two major parts. One part is the central nervous system. This is comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system includes all other nerves in the body and the ganglia outside of them. Here in this illustration, you can see that the brain and the spinal cord are sort of like that reddish color and everything else is the bluish color. We're going to focus on the central nervous system in this video. As I mentioned, the central nervous system has two parts, the brain and the spinal cord. This photograph shows a real brain and a real spinal cord. The top of the photo, you can see the circular part, which is the brain. Below the brain, you'll see a long cord that extends downward. The spinal cord is the long cord with nerves that extend through it. Some of these nerves are shorter and some of them are longer. The brain is comprised of billions of interconnected neurons and glia, which we talked about in the last video. The brain is bilateral, meaning that it has two distinct sides. It can be separated into distinct lobes, but all the areas interact with one another. The spinal cord is comprised of sensory nerves that are bringing messages in and up to the brain with the help of relay neurons. The spinal cord is also comprised of motor nerves. The motor nerves are sending the messages out of the brain to the muscles and the organs to communicate the response. The top of the spinal cord merges with the brain stem. The bottom of the spinal cord ends just below your ribs. We will begin by looking at the brain in detail. The most powerful computer known is the brain. It's a three pound miracle. The human brain possesses about 100 billion neurons with roughly one quadrillion, meaning one million billion connections known as synapses wiring these cells together. It controls all physiological and cognitive functions. It controls the lower unconscious physiological activities like keeping your heart going, breathing, digestion, and it also controls higher conscious activities like thinking and purposeful movement. The features of the brain give us some ideas of how it is so powerful. The surface of the brain is known as the cerebral cortex. When you envision the brain, you probably think of the brain 
as this organ with all these bumps and folds in it. The number of bumps and folds the brain has is directly related to the capacity that the organism has for intellectual thought. For example, mouse brains are relatively smooth, whereas human brains have lots of folds and bumps. The bumps and folds are called gyri, or gyrus for plural. In this diagram, you can see the actual folds right here are the gyrus, right? One of them is gyri, the more than one is gyrus. Between the gyrus, there are either small folds called sulci or sulcus, if there's more than one, or there's very large grooves called fissures. So if it's got a shallow groove, it's a sulci, and if it's got a very deep groove, it's a fissure. The longitudinal fissure is this big, deep fold in the center of the brain. This is what divides the brain into two hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Lateralization is the concept that each hemisphere of the brain is associated with a specialized function. The left hemisphere controls the right side of the body, and the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body. The corpus callosum is the connective tissue that connects the left and right hemispheres of the brain. The corpus callosum is a large bundle of more than 200 million myelinated nerve fibers. Damage to the corpus callosum or disruptions with these nerve fibers do not allow both hemispheres of the brain to communicate properly. Abnormalities with the corpus callosum have been identified in maltreated or abused children. The brain can be divided into three divisions, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. The forebrain is by far the largest brain division. It includes the cerebrum, which accounts for about two-thirds of the brain's mass and covers most of other brain structures. The forebrain processes sensory information, helps with reasoning, problem solving, and regulates body and motor functions. The midbrain is the area of the brain that connects the forebrain to the hindbrain. The midbrain and hindbrain together compose the brain stem. The brain stem is what connects the spinal cord with the cerebrum. The midbrain possesses information received through hearing and vision. The hindbrain assists in the regulation of autonomic functions, maintaining balance and equilibrium, movement coordination, and the relay of sensory information. We're going to look at each division in more detail now. The forebrain contains the cerebrum, thalamus, and limbic system, which involves the hypothalamus, amygdala, and hippocampus. The cerebrum is covered by the cerebral cortex. We talked about the cerebral cortex being the surface of the brain, which has the bumps and folds called the gyri, the small grooves called the sulci, the large grooves called fissures. The longest fissure, or the deepest fissure, is the longitudinal fissure, and that is what divides the brain in the two halves. The two halves are connected by the corpus callosum. As I mentioned earlier, the cerebral cortex, the surface of the brain, is what is associated with our highest mental capacities, such as consciousness, thought, emotion, reasoning, language and memory. The cerebrum is broken up into four lobes, and each one of those has a different function. The four lobes of the cerebrum are the frontal lobe, which involves thinking, the parietal lobe, which involves touch, the temporal lobe, which involves hearing, speaking, and memory, and the occipital lobe, where the focus is for vision. The frontal lobe is the boss of the brain. The frontal lobe is located in the front of the brain by the forehead. The frontal lobe is in charge of thinking, reasoning, decision-making, and planning for the future. Personality is also housed in the frontal lobe. Since the frontal lobe is so complex, it takes a long time to fully develop. In fact, the frontal lobe is actually the last part of the brain to finish developing. A person's frontal lobe isn't fully developed until they are at least 25 
to 30 years old. So what can happen if the frontal lobe is damaged? By looking at a case study, the case study of Phineas Gage, we can get information about how the frontal lobe relates to our behavior. While Phineas Gage was working as a railroad foreman, an accident caused an iron rod, which he's holding in this photograph, to penetrate through Gage's skull and into the frontal lobe. Gage's prefrontal cortex was severely damaged in the left hemisphere of his brain. The rod entered Gage's face on the left side, passed behind his eye, and exited through the top half of his skull, landing about 80 feet away. So this thing just speared right through him. After the accident, his family, his friends, his co-workers started to notice changes in his personality. Before the accident, Gage was well-mannered and soft-spoken. After the accident, he started behaving in odd and inappropriate ways. These changes were consistent with the loss of impulse control and the lack of reasoning that is attributed to the function of the frontal lobe. The parietal lobe is located at the top of the brain. Its main job is to process information about our sense of touch. This includes information about temperature, pain, pressure, and texture. The body is very big and we have nerves all around our whole bodies that are constantly sending signals about temperature, pain, and pressure to the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe has to help the brain understand all these signals. The parietal lobe also helps our brain understand whether we are standing, lying up down, or hanging upside down. In other words, it gives us information about our body's position in space or orientation in space. This job is really complex. The cells in our eyes collect information about light. The parietal lobe merges the information that we receive from both our eyes information that comes from the occipital lobe that we'll talk about in a second to create one image and help us orient ourselves in space. Damage to the parietal lobe results in the unawareness of the person's position in space, their loss of equilibrium, and distinguishing left from right. It will also cause spatial disorientation and difficulty in understanding spoken or written language. To test for parietal lobe damage, Physicians can do an interlocking finger test. This is a photograph of the interlocking finger test that can be used by doctors to informally assess parietal lobe damage. The examiner directly faces the patient during the presentation and continues to demonstrate each finger movement until the patient felt that they had accurately reproduced it. The ability to imitate the four figures, either none of the times, some of the times, or all of the times, will give physicians information on whether more tests will be needed to evaluate the patient. The temporal lobe is located on both sides of the brain near the ears. The temporal lobe is in charge of lots of things, including hearing, language, and memory. It makes sense that the temporal lobe helps the brain process sound because it's so close to the ears. Since the temporal lobe is in charge of our sense of hearing, it also plays an important role in music. It helps us process parts of music, like rhythm and pitch. The temporal lobe is important in helping us form words to communicate and listen to words to understand language. Memory, which is a very complex process, also uses part of the temporal lobes to function. The temporal lobe is in charge of the very specific part of memory that allows us to remember words, objects, and faces. Damage to the temporal lobe results in difficulty recognizing faces, unable to recognize common objects, unable to process language, hearing difficulties, memory loss, emotional disturbances, and sense distortion. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is caused by broken protein deposits in the temporal lobe. Autopsies on Aaron Hernandez, Frank Gifford, Andre Waters, and Junior Seau all showed that they had damage to their temporal lobe and were diagnosed with having chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, is a progressive brain condition that is thought to be caused by repeated blows to the head and repeated episodes of concussion. Individuals with CTE may experience anger or aggression 
due to the difficulties of processing their surrounding environment. The occipital lobe is located right at the back of the brain and has a very important job. The occipital lobe houses our visual cortex, so it helps us to see. The occipital lobe receives information from millions of cells in our eyes and processes all that information to help us understand what we're seeing. This job is incredibly complex. The cells in our eyes collect information about light, and then our occipital lobe has to turn that information into a picture with color, texture, size, and distance, and so much more. Since we have two eyes, our occipital lobe also has to combine the information from both eyes so that we only see one picture. That's a lot of work for the lobe to do, and that's the reason why the parietal part of the brain helps us process this information. Damage to the occipital lobe results in loss of the visual field, inability to locate objects, difficulty identifying colors, having hallucinations, blindness, and movement perception. Occipital lobe trauma can cause epileptic seizures and cause people to experience hallucinations. This is a photograph of a drawing by a 71-year-old man that experienced trauma to the occipital lobe of the brain. He would see shimmering, flashing tails of color dripping down, which he compared to fireworks. When the doctors examined his eyes, there was nothing wrong with his eyes. So these hallucinations were coming from the damage in the brain, not the function of the actual eye organ. These hallucinations, though beautiful, caused him to experience headaches at times the episodes would blind him completely or leave a visual deficit in the right field of his vision for minutes after they subsided. After many tests, the doctors made the diagnosis that this man was experiencing an epileptic seizure in the occipital lobe of the brain. This seizure was due to the trauma that his brain had incurred. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the thalamus and the limbic system. To be honest, that deserves its own video. But just as an overview, the thalamus serves as the relay center of the brain where most of the senses, except for smell, are routed before being directed to the other areas of the brain for processing. The limbic system is a group of interconnected structures of the brain that include the hypothalamus, amygdala, and hippocampus. They are all located beneath the cortex and they are common to all mammals. They are associated with emotions, particularly those that are related to survival, such as fear and pleasure, memory, motivation, and various autonomic functions. The amygdala is involved in our experience of emotion and tying emotional meaning to our memories. They are also involved in processing fear. Hippocampus structure is associated with learning and memory, in particular spatial memory. The hypothalamus regulates homeostatic processes including body temperature, appetite, and blood pressure. The next division of the brain is the midbrain. The midbrain is comprised of structures located deep within the brain, between the forebrain and the hindbrain. It controls reflex movements of the body and hearing reflexes. There are a few midbrain structures that are worth mentioning. These structures are involved in mood, reward, and addiction. The reticular formation is centered in the midbrain, but it actually extends up into the forebrain and down the hindbrain. The reticular formation is important in regulating sleep-wake cycle, arousal, alertness, and motor activity. The substantia nigra, Latin for black substance, and the ventricle tegmental area, or VTA, are also located in the midbrain. Both regions contain cell bodies that produce the neurotransmitter dopamine, and both are critical for movement. Degeneration of the substantia nigra and the VTA is involved in Parkinson's disease. The last division of the brain is the hindbrain. The hindbrain is located way in the back of the head and looks like an extension of the spinal cord. It contains the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum. The medulla controls 
the automatic processes of the autonomic nervous system, such as breathing, blood pressure, and heart rate. The pons, which means bridge, literally bridges the brain and the spinal cord. It's also involved in regulating brain activity while you sleep. The medulla and pons and the midbrain together are called the brainstem. The cerebellum, which is Latin for little brain, receives messages from the muscles, tendons, joints, and structures in our ear to control balance, coordination, movement, and motor skills. The cerebellum is also thought to be an important area for processing some types of memories, in particular procedural memory or memory involved in the learning and remembering of how to perform tasks. By using brain imaging technology, physicians and researchers can analyze the brain by representing its structures in images and measuring brain activity. This can be done using a variety of different ways. There are techniques that involve radiation, like the CT scan or the PET scan. There are techniques that involve using magnetic fields, like the MRI or the fMRI. And there are also techniques that involve using electrical activity, such as the EEG. Computerized tomography, or CT scan, involves using x-rays and creates an image through x-rays passing through various densities within the brain. The results of a CT scan provide more detail than a standard x-ray. CT scans use a variety of x-ray images and convert those cross-sectional images of your brain. These x-rays are combined to form cross-sectional slices or even 3D models of your brain. CT scans can find certain types of brain injuries, identify cancer, locate brain swelling or bleeding, and also reveal structural brain changes from mental disorders such as schizophrenia. A positron emission tomography, or PET scan, uses a radioactive tracer that attaches to the glucose in your bloodstream. Glucose is the main fuel of the brain. By detecting radioactive glucose, the PET scan can show which areas of the brain are using glucose at the highest rates. When a specialist interprets the scan, they can see how the brain is working and check for any irregularities. PET scans are used to help diagnose and manage many central nervous system disorders, such as Alzheimer's, depression, epilepsy, head trauma, and Parkinson's disease. In this image, we see how a normal brain is using the glucose more than a brain of a patient that has some mild cognitive impairment and much more than a patient that has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. In magnetic resonance imaging, or MRIs, magnetic fields are used to produce a picture of the tissue being imaged. An fMRI is an MRI that shows changes in activity over time, so more like a video. The MRI allows doctors to examine a patient's brain. An fMRI looks at the function of the brain. MRIs and fMRIs can assess the brain activities, find brain abnormalities, and also help surgeons create a pre-surgical brain map. Electroencephalography, or EEG, is a test that measures the brain's electrical waves. Using electrodes, modern EEG research can study the precise timing of overall brain activities by tracking amplitude and frequency of brain waves. Before the scan, clinicians will attach small electrodes to a patient's scalp that are attached to wires. These electrodes detect the electrical activity in the brain and send it to a computer where it creates a graph-like image. Each type of frequency appears on its own line and gives the doctor information about the brain activity. EGs can detect issues such as anxiety, head injuries, epilepsy, and sleep disruption. In today's video, we learned the body communicates using two systems, the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system is divided into two major parts. The central nervous system, which consists of the brain and spinal cord, is the command center of the entire body, and the peripheral nervous system, which consists of all other nerves. The brain is divided into four different lobes. Each lobe is responsible for different body functions.
Finally, brain imaging technology can represent and measure brain activity. For reflection, please take a few moments to consider the following open-ended question. Why is the central nervous system capable of so many functions simultaneously? I'd love to get your thoughts in the comments below. That's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will discuss memories. Before you go, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to Stats with Taurus for more Psych 101. Looking forward to it. Ciao!